One of the most damning criticisms of contemporary preaching is often voiced like this. The trouble with you preachers is you just don't speak my language. You don't say anything that relates to my world. Now there's a lot of truth in that criticism, but I want you to listen to a response that was given by William Willimon. He's a, a well-known and a widely read bishop in the United Methodist Church. And here's what he said in response to that criticism. Listen, because it's not what you're going to expect. He said, where in the world would you get the notion that I or any of my pastoral sisters or brothers would want to speak in your language or to your world? I don't want to speak to your world. I want to rock your world. I want to give you a new language that you wouldn't know without my preaching. I want to destroy your world and offer you another. I'm a prophet for God's sake. End of quote. Now that's not the answer you expected. That is so different from most of the contemporary evangelical preaching that we hear today, which seems to be more concerned with, with listener approval and visible results and church growth and seeker sensitivity and user friendliness than it is with hearing what God has to say. Perhaps what the church needs today more than anything else is prophetic preaching. Preaching that is strongly tied to a sovereign, active, opinionated, totalitarian, intrusive, invasive God. And that's who he is. And maybe our preaching needs to be tied a little more directly to him. So today, as I've announced, I'm going out on a limb, so to speak, and, and I'm going to begin a series of lessons from the uh, so-called minor prophets of the Old Testament. And I'm going to preach one lesson from each prophet, no matter how long or short that book is. I'm just going to preach one lesson, and so since there are 12 of them, it's going to take us, the Lord willing, 12 weeks to go through this series. Now, I mentioned the need for prophetic preaching. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. It's not preaching that tries to predict the future and end times and all the things that are going to happen when the Lord returns. I'll tell you what, I'm going to leave that to the TV preachers. To me, prophetic preaching is what those Old Testament prophets did. Now, it is true they made some predictions about future events, but their main task was to preach to the people of their day and call them back to God, call them to come to repentance in the presence of God. And I believe if the modern church or world needs anything, it is to be called back to God, to be called back to the Word of God. Folks, we need to be called to repentance. We need it. We need to repent of our idolatries, of our immorality, our greed, our selfishness and self-centeredness. We need to repent of our pride and our elitism and all the other sins that infect us as a people. And so I, I'm going to use the minor prophets as a way to issue that call back to God, a call to us as the people of God right here, and perhaps then that message will go out into the community and into the world. Now let me give you a little background information about these Old Testament books. They're, they're not called the minor prophets because they're less important than the others. They're not called that because they were written at a later date, it really is simply a matter of length. The major prophets are generally longer and the minor prophets are generally shorter. Now you might look and notice that, well look here, uh, Hosea and, uh, and Zechariah, both minor prophets have 14 chapters and Daniel, a major prophet, has only 12. So how does that fit? Well, if you count verses, Words, Daniel is much longer. Daniel contains 357 verses, while Zechariah only has 210, and Hosea only has 197. So the, the shorter, longer, minor, major designation seems to hold up. But you need to know this, that major and minor prophets is not a biblical term. That's just something that people have come up with, I guess, to help 
uh, designate these books and maybe help us in our study, but it's not really a biblical term. Now, these prophets spoke for God over a period of about 400 years, from 800 B.C. until 400 B.C. Their message was basically to the Israelites. I want you to remember that by the 8th century B.C., the kingdom of David and Solomon had been divided into two nations, Israel and Judah. And so the message of the minor prophets is basically to the Israelites living in one of those two nations. However, some of their messages were to other nations. Obadiah, for example, he spoke exclusively to the nation of Edom. Jonah is sent to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. But whoever their audience was, I believe their message is timeless and that these Old Testament books can have a tremendous impact on those of us living now in the 21st century. So we're going to study these books in the order of their appearance in our arrangement of the Bible. We're not going to look at them chronologically necessarily, but in the order that they appear in our English Bibles. And so that means our first study is going to be in the book of Hosea. And you might want to find a Bible and open to Hosea. I hope you don't have any trouble finding it. Obadiah is really hard to find, one page in the Old Testament. But you might want to open to the book of Hosea. Now, Keaton, I've got a number of verses we're going to go through, so I'll call on you each time that I want one, okay? The prophet Hosea gives a very clear indication of when he spoke for God. It was during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, the king of Israel. This places him right in the middle of the 8th century before Christ, about 750 B.C. He took his message to the northern kingdom, Israel, and you need to know that that kingdom was often called Ephraim, and he took it to the people of that nation and to the king, Jeroboam II. This was a time of anarchy, a time of bloodshed and revolt, and although that nation seemed to be relatively healthy and prosperous, it was actually in the process of breaking apart. And in just a few decades, by 721, that nation is gone. It's history, captured, or taken by the Assyrians and the people led away into captivity. Spiritually, the people had left God. Listen to his indictment of Israel. The next slide, Keaton. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying and murder, stealing and adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. That's chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, much of the book is devoted to explaining these charges over and over through the prophet, God reminded the people of their sin and also of the coming judgment if they did not repent. And in all of that, Hosea is, he's pretty much like all the other prophets, but there is something different about him. There's something very different in his message and it comes out in his life experience. God used Hosea as a living object lesson. And I guess God often does that, but he uses Hosea as this living object lesson. I want you to listen to God's word to Hosea. Now, before we go there, Keaton, just a moment, would you, would you go back to the one before that? Okay. I'm going to read from the message. And the language is shocking. The language is offensive. And it seems to me that that's the very point that God is trying to make. He's not soft peddling anything here. Now, I hope that some of you don't have a hard time explaining to some of the younger children why I'm going to talk like I'm going to talk. But this is, this is from the word of God. He just seems to be using this language so that he can get Israel's complete attention. So now to the next slide, Keaton, if you would. This is what God says. The first time God spoke to Hosea, he said, find a whore and marry her. Make this whore the mother of your children. And here's why. The whole country has become a whorehouse, unfaithful 
to me. That's chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Whore. The sound of that word is as ugly as the activity it depicts. And we want to soften it. We, we want to use terms like prostitute or hooker or streetwalker or woman of the night. But of all the words that describe this kind of promiscuity, none is as abrasive as the word whore. And that's what God says Israel is like. This isn't a pretty story. This is the story about a woman who became a wife and a mother and yet remained a whore. And we need to be appalled by this. If you are not shocked and appalled by this, you may be as indifferent as the people who heard the message here the first time. It needs to shock us. It needs to appall us. And then Hosea obeys God. And he married a woman named Gomer, and she bore him three children. And then it appears that she left him to continue in her promiscuity. And then Hosea is commanded to go and take her back. Next slide, Keaton. Then God ordered me, start all over. Love your wife again. Your wife who's in bed with her latest boyfriend, your cheating wife. Love her the way I, God, love the Israelite people, even as they flirt and party with every God that takes their fancy. Chapter 3, verse 1. And that's exactly what Hosea did. Go ahead, Keaton. Next slide. I did it. I paid good money to get her back. It cost me the price of a slave. And then I told her, from now on, you're living with me. No more whoring. No more sleeping around. You're living with me, and I'm living with you. Wow, what a story, folks. Hollywood can't do anything to top this story. TV can't, you know, the, the soap operas can't top this story. But this is the story of how God loves his people in spite of their unfaithfulness. As one writer said, the shocking scandal of Hosea's message is the incomprehensible and incomparable nature of God of a God who loves the unlovable with an illogical loyalty. See, the most scandalous character in this story is not Gomer, and it's not Hosea. It is Yahweh. It is God. He's the most scandalous person in the story. The real scandal of this book is that of a heartbroken God who absolutely refuses to stop loving an unfaithful people. He refuses to stop loving his people. And so this book, this whole book, compels us to consider a God who chooses to reveal himself in such an undignified manner. Have you thought about that? I mean, how dare God, our, our holy, our righteous, our all-knowing, our all-powerful all God, how dare he reveal himself in the disgusting imagery of the steadfast love of a husband for a heartless whore of a wife. How dare he do that? But that's how God feels, folks. That's who he is. That's what he does. The message of Hosea is that God cannot be indifferent toward his people. Oh, we may be indifferent. We may be apathetic. We may be totally unfeeling toward God, but not him. Listen again to God's word to Hosea. Next slide. And now, this is God talking. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start all over again. Just like he said to Hosea, start all over again. You go get her and bring her back. God says, I'm going to start all over again. I'm taking her back out into the wilderness where we had our first date. And I'll court her. And I'll give her bouquets of roses. I'll turn Heartbreak Valley into Acres of Hope. She'll respond like she did when she was a young girl, those days when she was fresh out of Egypt. At that time, this is God's message still, you'll address me, dear husband. Never again will you address me, my slave master. I'll wash your mouth out with soap. Get rid of all the dirty, false God names, not so much as a whisper of those names again. At the same time, I'll make a peace treaty between you and the wild animals and birds and reptiles and get rid of all weapons of war. Think of it, safe from beasts and bullies 
and then I'll marry you for good, forever. I'll marry you true and proper in love and tenderness. Yes, I'll marry you and neither leave you nor let you go. You'll know me, God, for who I really am. That's chapter 2, verses 14 through 20. God just will not let his people go. He loves them too much for that. But there is a problem. There's a problem. Israel was not willing to be courted. Israel didn't want to be wooed by God. Her heart was hard. Her, her ears were deaf to God's calling. And so Yahweh tells them what he's going to do in this next slide. Go on to that one, Keaton, if you would. He says, I'll charge them like a lion, like a leopard stalking in the brush. I'll jump them like a sow grizzly robbed of her cubs. I'll rip out their guts. Coyotes will make a meal of them. Crows will clean their bones. I'm going to destroy you, Israel. Who's going to stop me? That's 13, 7 through 9. And you have to say, what in the world's going on here? Is this the same God we just read about in chapter 2? I mean, we've gone from romancing the heart to ripping it out. What kind of God is this? Is he Casanova or is he Hannibal Lecter? Who is this God? Well, I'll tell you. He's a God who has a heart. And he loves so deeply that he cannot let his people go undisciplined when they turn away from him. It is his love that brings judgment on his people. It is his love that brings them discipline. But now, I want you to listen to the anguish of his heart. Listen to this. And remember, as I read this, go ahead, Keaton, the next slide, that this is God talking. But how can I give up on you, Ephraim? How can I turn you loose, Israel? How can I leave you to be ruined like Adma, devastated like luckless Zeboam? I can't bear to even think such thoughts. My insides churn in protest, and so I'm not going to act in my anger. I'm not going to destroy Ephraim, and why not? Because I am God, not a human. I'm the Holy One, and I'm here in your very midst. You want to know how God feels when we no longer have feelings for him, when we turn our back on him, when we flip him off, so to speak, you want to know how God feels? He still loves us. And what makes this so scandalous is that we are such scoundrels. I think we have something in common with 8th century B.C. Israel. They had a hard time hearing this message. We have a hard time hearing the message because we believe ourselves to be so spiritual. We cannot conceive of ourselves as Gomer, but we are. There are times when all of us, I don't care how spiritual you think you are, there are times when all of us listen to the song of the one who hates us. We listen to the song of the world hater, Satan, and he convinces us, as he did Adam and Eve, to go about living life our own way and not God's. And, of course, that manifests itself in so many diff different ways, immorality, greed, racism, lack of integrity, lying, all of those kind of things. How does God feel when we live like that? He still loves us. And he will do whatever it takes to get us back. In fact, he already has done whatever it takes to get us back by giving us the gracious gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And if there's anyone here who doubts that God loves you, maybe you're really in the depths and you think, well, God doesn't love me, you need to look at Jesus because he is the proof, the absolute proof of divine love. So no matter how deep you've gone into whoredom, no matter how far away from God you've strayed, he still loves you. And like Hosea did for Gomer, God has paid the price to bring you back, to buy you back. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to leave this place of worship. And as we walk out the door, we will either walk away from God's love or we'll walk in it. We will leave here to live as if God's love means nothing to us 
or we will leave here to live as if we owe everything to his love. But no matter how you, how you leave, no matter how you walk out of this place, I want you to leave knowing this, God still loves you. He may use that word to describe you. He may bring judgment into your life because of your sin, but he loves you. And he wants you to come back to him and enjoy that intimate fellowship, that intimate relationship that a husband has with a wife. He wants you to enjoy life as his beloved. You can't fall so far away that God can't bring you back. Right before I started this sermon, we sang an old hymn. I bet most of you didn't even think much about it. Did you notice the title? Oh, love that will not let me go. That's God. His love will not let us go. Those are true words. And I urge you to believe those words. And come to him if you need to. Come back to him. You cannot fall far enough away that you cannot come back to God. And that's the plea that we make for all of us, that we come back, that we return over and over to him. Because like Hosea loved Gomer, only on just such a greater level, God loves us. And nothing will stop him from loving us. But if you need to come back, we're going to sing another verse of that song. Love will not let me go. And maybe you would like to respond in some way, perhaps asking for prayer. Maybe you'd like to be baptized, whatever that might be. While we stand and sing this song, let us know how we can serve you. Let's stand together.